This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. What is going on, mere mortals? My name is John Solo, and I have a personal question to ask you. Have you ever felt overshadowed by someone close to you, like a sibling or a cousin or even a friend? Someone who you got along with and truly wanted the best for, but at the same time, you kind of wanted them to stop being so perfect? If you answered yes, then you're gonna relate heavily to today's subject, Iphicles, Heracles' twin brother. That's right, Heracles had a twin, and in this episode, we're giving him the spotlight he deserves. Because imagine what it must have been like for him. Put yourself in his shoes and wonder, who would give a single centaur sh about your achievements when your brother is a demigod who wrestles lions, slays hydras, and conquers entire kingdoms? Evidently, no one, because the ancient poets didn't write a whole lot about him. In most of the myths he's featured in, he barely plays a supporting role. He's like a single step up from being a background character, kind of like Gunther from Friends. And honestly, that's a huge shame because it's not like Iphicles was cowering in the corner while his legendary brother was laying waste to entire armies. He actually fought right alongside Heracles on a number of his adventures. So we're going to take a look at some of those adventures from Iphicles' perspective, including the time that Heracles did the unforgivable but was still forgiven. If you haven't already, make sure you sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods, especially if you enjoy content about Greek mythology and want more of it in your sub box every week. And now, the messed up mythology of Iphicles. The story of Iphicles begins the same way a lot of Greek myths begin. Once upon a time, Zeus was horny, but to no one's surprise, the woman he was horny for was not his wife, the goddess Hera. No, instead, he had set his eye upon his great-granddaughter, Alcmene, who was the soon-to-be wife of his great-grandson, Amphitryon. Yeah, I found out during my research that Alcmene and Amphitryon are both the children of Perseus's children, meaning they're cousins. Hi, sorry to interrupt, but it turns out I was wrong about this, and the real story is even fucking weirder. If you take a look at this family tree I made, you'll see that Alcmene and Amphitryon aren't actually cousins, they're uncle and niece. But this is no Frank getting a handy under the table from Gale the Snail, because at least they weren't related by blood. This is straight up Daemon and Rhaenyra Targaryen levels of fucked up. Not only that, but if you look at Alcmene's parents, you'll see that her mom was also married to her uncle. What is it with this family? Anyway, I just wanted to clear that up. Let's get back to Zeus wanting to bang his granddaughter. Now this attraction Zeus was feeling toward Alcmene wasn't a new thing. He'd been watching her for a while and knew that per her father's wishes, she was going to remain a virgin until Amphitryon earned the right to marry her. And on this particular day, Amphitryon had done just that. He was currently sailing home from a successful excursion in the islands of Tephos, where he led an army and took revenge for her brother's death. Yeah, Disney did Amphitryon dirty by making him an old peasant farmer in the animated movie. Dude was kind of a badass. Anyway, while Amphitryon was still on his way home to Thebes, who else but Zeus would appear in Alcmene's door? And here's where it gets creepy. Alcmene didn't know that her visitor was Zeus because Zeus had disguised himself as Amphitryon. Even worse, he had actually spent the past few days watching Amphitryon's conflict go down so he could accurately relay to her what happened and that he was successful in avenging her brother. Well, this was the greatest news Alcmene had heard for a while. So to celebrate, she let who she thought was her husband climb on top of her and flop around for a little bit. But the couple then went to bed and when she woke up in the morning, he was nowhere to be found. So imagine her surprise and confusion that afternoon when her husband comes home again and excitedly fills her in on how successful his expedition was. You can't blame her for finding that a little sus. And when she told Amphitryon that they had already gone through all these motions the day before, the couple decided to meet with a seer named Tiresias to figure out what the hell was going on. And he confirmed that the man she had slept with was indeed Zeus. Now we aren't told exactly when Alcmene and the real Amphitryon get it on. The writer of this story, Apollodorus, skips ahead to say that Alcmene gave birth to two sons and that only one was Zeus's, but they didn't know which until about eight months later. You see, Hera, Zeus's wife, was not happy about him having another bastard child. In fact, she had previously ordered Ilithia, the goddess of childbirth, 
to prolong Alcmini's labor in the hopes that the struggle would result in the baby's death. When that didn't work, she had to patiently bide her time until her next opportunity to strike without Zeus finding out. And that came about eight months later when Zeus left Olympus on some kind of business, probably to get another granddaughter pregnant. Hera sent two massive serpents to kill Alcmini's babies. The goddess also didn't know which one was Zeus's, so she figured, eh, might as well snuff out both just to be safe. Hera's plan backfired though, because when baby Heracles saw the snakes, he reached out with his chubby little baby hands and strangled them to death. <laughs> Funnily enough, the writers at Disney found a way to incorporate this scene into the movie too. And just like the myth, the incident was also used to signal to his adoptive parents that Hercules wasn't from the realm of men. You know, just in case there was any doubt left after they found his medal with the symbol of the gods. But check out this crazy sh**, mere mortals. There are some variants of this incident where the snakes weren't sent by Hera at all, but instead Amphitryon put them in the crib. And when he saw Heracles choke the snakes while Iphicles pooped his pants, like a normal baby would, he knew that Poopy Pants was his son. So as you can see, Heracles' path as a hero was woven by the fates pretty early on. He wasn't even speaking yet and already managed to save his brother's life. This would not be the end of the two's adventures though. They still had many armies to conquer and monsters left to slay. Now, since the vast majority of Iphicles' adventures involve the heroics of Heracles, I'd like to start with a myth where he ventures out without his brother, or rather, the only myth that doesn't involve his brother. It's one that we've actually talked about a few times in the past, the hunt for the Caledonian boar. For those who need a refresher, the Caledonian boar was conjured up by the hunting goddess Artemis as punishment for King Enus after he sacrificed to all of the gods except for her during the yearly harvest ceremony. The boar ravaged the district of Caledon for weeks, killing innocents and destroying property, until finally the king had to accept that the usual hunting strategies weren't going to cut it and ordered his son Meleager to put together a group of highly skilled individuals to slay the beast. It turns out that Iphicles was one of these dozen or so heroes, at least according to Apollodorus. It should be noted though that Homer's Iliad, which was written about a thousand years before Apollodorus was even born, doesn't mention Iphicles at all. Either way, his presence doesn't have much influence over the hunt. The hunters who did significant damage were Atalanta, whose arrow drew first blood, Amphiaros, who shot it in the eye, and Meleager, who finished the beast off with his spear. Though we shouldn't underestimate the role this huge group played in overwhelming the boar's senses with fear and danger. Besides, even if Iphicles did nothing of value at all, that's still better than the guy who threw a javelin and impaled one of his fellow hunters. So that is the only myth that Iphicles appears in where Heracles isn't mentioned. Our next story where Iphicles earns himself a wife ironically, barely involves Iphicles at all. See, one day when Heracles is on his way back from single-handedly slaughtering a lion that had been attacking people, he runs into some heralds sent by King Urginus to collect the tribute of 100 cows that the city of Thebes owes him in exchange for him not conquering them. In other words, Urginus is the school bully threatening to beat you up if you don't give him your lunch money. Heracles, with his finely tuned moral compass, thinks this deal is a bunch of bullshit and decides to give Urginus his own tribute by sending back his messengers with their ears, noses, and hands ripped off. Urginus is infuriated by this disrespect and marches alongside his army to ransack Thebes, but the mighty Heracles is waiting there to greet them with his own group of warriors made up of his adoptive father Amphitryon, his brother Iphicles, and some Thebans. I'm sad to report that Amphitryon was tragically killed during the ensuing battle, but Apollodorus tells us he went down fighting bravely and his sons were rewarded by Creon, the king of Thebes, who wanted Heracles to marry his oldest daughter, Megara, and Iphicles to marry his youngest daughter, Pyrrha. Apollodorus also adds that at this point, Iphicles had already married Princess Automedusa, which I'm pretty sure is the name of a Decepticon, but the story of how their union came to be has never been uncovered. What we do know is that he sired his son Iolaus with her and Iolaus would go on to be Heracles' charioteer and help him out with many of his 12 labors. But speaking of the 12 labors, here's where things get really dark. 
You see, Heracles would go on to have two or three sons with Megara, while Iphicles would have two of his own with Pyrrha. None of these children would make it to adulthood though, because Hera, who still hadn't gotten over Zeus's affair with Alcmene, even though it happened like 20 years ago at this point, cursed Heracles with a fit of madness. And during his rage, he threw his wife, his children, and Iphicles' children into a fire, burning them alive. Now, I have no doubt that everyone watching this has experienced some kind of family drama in their lives, and I by no means want to trivialize your problems, but does it get worse than your sibling killing your children with fire? Like that's a line that even Jerry Springer in his heyday wouldn't cross. And that dude had people on his show who had affairs with ghosts. The even crazier part is that evidently, Iphicles would forgive Heracles for this heinous crime because the two would go on to fight alongside each other in a number of battles after this. Though I have to imagine that things were pretty awkward for a while. Now, before we move on to Iphicles' final days of living in his twin shadow, I wanna tell you all about our sponsor, our old friends at Squarespace. Are you an artist, small business owner, or creator? Do you need a way to show off, market, and sell your talents that doesn't limit you to the creative confines of social media? Building your own website is a great place to start, and there's no one that makes it easier than Squarespace. Their setup process could not be more simple. All you have to do is choose one of their dozens of award-winning templates, then customize it. I did the very same thing for MessedUpOrigins.com, where I've got links to our series playlists, galleries full of solo fam art, and my personal favorite, a page where you can listen to the Messed Up Origins podcast. The crazy thing is, I'm only scratching the surface of what's possible. You can also embed videos on your site, sell access to members-only areas, and sell your own products. Even order management, shipping, and fulfilling can all be done through Squarespace. So if you want to take your hobbies or passion projects to the next level, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to sign up for your free trial. Then be sure to use code John Solo for 10% off your first purchase, whether it be a website or domain. So depending on the poet that you're reading, there are two possible ways that Iphicles' death goes down, and both entail fighting in a battle that his brother started. In Apollodorus's The Library, he states that Heracles had brought an army to the city of Lacedaemon, or as it would go on to be called, Sparta. He had intended to punish the sons of Hippocoon, the king, for siding against him in a recent war. And soon after they arrived, the son of one of his comrades was killed by the king's followers after he had defensively thrown a stone at one of his guard dogs that had tried to maul him. When this happened, Heracles was doubly motivated to get his revenge, and in the battle that ensued, Iphicles would be killed. Yeah, pretty anticlimactic. So it's a good thing we have Pausanias' version. His writings state that Iphicles died from an injury he received in the battle against the Aeleans and Augeas. And the reason I like this variant more is that his killers are given an identity. Pausanias says he was grievously injured by the sons of Actor, Eurytus, and Satiatus, who were actually the generals in charge of the opposing army and described as two men joined in one who surpassed all of that generation in strength. In other words, Words, his killers weren't just two random guys. They were two of the strongest and most skilled warriors that existed at that time. They were also descendants of gods. Their grandfather was Aeolus, god of the wind. And who is the god of the wind? Guess who's the god of the winds? I am. <laughs> So after Iphicles was injured, he was brought back to the city of Phineas, where he was treated by a random citizen named Bufagus and Bufagus's wife. But ultimately, he would die from his wounds. And as unfortunate as that is, you'll be happy to hear that despite all the ruckus his brother caused, Iphicles was not forgotten. As a matter of fact, Pausanias specifically mentions that in the city of Phineas, Iphicles is still sacrificed to as a hero. Not a bad way to be remembered, I've gotta say. It also makes me wonder what other Iphicles stories we'll never find. Because there's obviously gotta be a few of those, right? I mean, experts assume we've only uncovered about 1% of ancient Greek writings. And no disrespect, but Iphicles doesn't do anything particularly heroic through any of these stories. Don't get me wrong, risking your life on the front lines of battle is heroic as hell, but there were hundreds, if not thousands of other soldiers fighting alongside him on many of those occasions. So I'm just wondering what specifically the man could have done to be so respected by the Phoenicians. Don't jump. Good boy. 
That's my bubba. He actually wants to be on camera this time. Such is the curse of studying mythology. It always leaves us wanting more, but there is no more. So get out of here, will ya? I'm just kidding. Look, I have a dog. Please don't leave us. At least not without sacrificing the like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods. No joke, that goes a long way in giving the channel a boost in the algorithm and helping my content reach more eyes and ears. Plus, if you do like and subscribe, you'll get more messed up mythology sent to your sub box every week. At least that's supposed to be what happens. I've been getting a ton of complaints lately that you guys aren't seeing my stuff in your sub boxes. So with that in mind, you might wanna follow us on the socials or subscribe to the podcast. Because in case you didn't know, we're posting remastered classic episodes every Monday and Wednesday, and all new episodes like this one on Fridays. Links to follow us on your favorite podcast platforms are in the description below and in the pinned comment. When you're through with that, consider following the channel on Twitter and Instagram under the Messed Up Origins handles, because that's a great way to stay updated on channel news and to learn even more about mythology and folklore. It's also a great backup for when the sub box isn't working, which is apparently most of the time lately. I'll see you all again next week with the start of our spoopy season of content. Until then, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first. Did you hate every second of that?